so, uh, so I'm not Dave Snyder, and uh, this is not Agile Actors, which would have been cool to go to. Um, I would have probably went to this one. Uh, so I put this together kind of last minute. Um, I was going to do a 7 on 7 on this and do kind of short ones, but it kind of blew up on me as I was creating it. And it actually fit better for this, so, which is good. Uh, so I'll be talking about uh, an item manager framework that I created, and essentially you never start off thinking you're going to create a framework. And this was the case for me. I basically just saw my code. I'm like, I'm doing the same thing over and over in my code because I really like this design uh, pattern that I'm using. And I had duplicated code with slight differences all over the place, and it disgust disgusted me. Like. You know, so I was like, okay, I need, to, I need to do something. So I made a template for myself to start off on, and then I found out there's a lot of code. One that looks like it, you know, a few items going, there's lots and lots of code behind it. So this is where this came from. Um, so in, and he uses some uh, concepts of dependency, dependency injection um, to do some of the loading, and uh, so it's kind of future proofing. And I used it on a couple of products, actually, uh, for future-proofing different uh, loading types. So. My name is uh, Michael Bussens. Uh, I'm at Intel uh, at a group that does stressor reliability testing. Uh, so I'm the one software guy in there. And uh, right now, I'm just leave myself, but uh, my manager tells me that we're probably going to get some more people. Uh, you know how that goes. Um, I've been a certified lab architect for a really long time. Um, and then uh, I did present back in 2012, um, but it's really scary being up here with all really smart people out in the audience. So don't usually, I, I'm usually on the other side trying to learn from everybody else. So. Um, now it's on the database room GUI, which uh, we were talking about latest code. It's actually still alive and well and doing really good. So um, I, I think we did a pretty good job on that. So. And yes, this is my real hair, and that's my bit of so, uh, so expected outcome of this is dancing the streets and dogs and cats this morning. So hopefully you get something out of this that you're excited about. Uh, because every time I look at this and I think about it, and I talk to people about it, if I can explain it, uh, that's, that's a big problem, is uh, I get excited about it. So, uh, I like it. so the problem statement I had is, um, I have a bunch of data, um, and I want to load that data into classes, and I want to launch uh, job classes based upon that data as well. So I have different types of data in my system. Some of this can be uh, system data, some of it can be user configuration data. In my case, it's um, it's you can almost view it as like a document that you're editing uh, that has pieces of data in it, and those pieces can differ from thing to thing depending on what they choose and what to use and what type of thing they want to uh, want to create in a head. So um, that's kind of the problem statement there. And then the other thing is I need to be able to modify that data within. So like if you have a document editor or whatever you're editing, uh, you need to be able to modify that uh, information um, that you have inside of your application. And you need to be able to load and say, and this is for me the kind of feature for improving part. You need to load and save from different um, different locations and different formats. So I might start off as an XML file on disk, uh, quick and easy, get things going uh, with the um, you know eventual goal of getting that into a database. Um, and those plans are already made, so I'm like, okay, I'll just put in, put in stuff right now. And I think uh, Sarah, you talked about not not doing that all the time, and I did read uh, uh, Uncle Bob's book about that, like, don't put it in unless you're actually going to use it, but uh, in this case, it would have been ripping apart a lot of the stuff, so um, it was nice to be able to do that. Um, so it's kind of generic, we all have to load data into our classes and use those, use those classes around our applications. Um, and that's why I created it. So here's kind of a, uh, a simple example of how you would load it. Uh, normally, you would you, you have your assembler VI or your class, and it creates your child classes here. You know, here I'm having a, a remote uh, repo configuration that's uh, Git-based, uh, HTTPS or SSH. Maybe you want to have a certification, stuff like that. You have to kind of manage it a little bit differently, and they have different uh, capabilities there. 
So I'll create them in my assembler, and then I'll make a repo config get class, and then pass that around in my, my manager class to the rest of my program so I can get these configurations if I need to. Uh, but I get them as repo configs, so my application doesn't know if I have uh, HTTPS or whatever. It just uses the repo config class. Uh, so the IMF framework, the one of the key differences is that the assembler doesn't call the children. Uh, I'm calling the kind of the top level uh, class, and um, it is loading the uh, data into the parent init method using name value pairs into that uh, into that API. So you might say, well, that, that's not an interface. That's a horrible interface. You have name value pairs on there. No, that's crazy. Um, which is true, so that's why um, you can, in your base child class, you can just make your regular interface cluster the data, whatever you want. Uh, you can make your init method, and you can always call that uh, call that init method from the parent class as well to load the data. Um, and I'll show you why that, that worked in mine. I don't ever use this, so I mean, you can use this most likely in unit testing. Um, but for, for my actual application, I didn't need to actually have these concrete classes with the event method with the API in it. So, I'll show you that. So, uh, the other thing is that the assembler format uh, and location uh, is abstracted. So, in this case, I have two different types of file in this database type uh, that I can then load my. Uh, Load in and create my object. Let's go into a simple example of the example for the XML here. So, for this, um, I have two classes on the bottom here. Um, so, this one is the, the, the remote config, and this is the repo. So, the repo contains multiple of these uh, remote configs. And you can see that for these remotes, I have different uh, tags that launch and look at the child class. So uh, I'll have the SSH and get each yes. And then for the other, uh, the main class, it, it just has one and it can be it. So these keys is actually, this is actually uh, defined by the, the framework itself. Um, where the, the capability is defined by the framework itself, but the implementation is done by, by the parent class. So, um, and the parameters can differ as well. So I can have many different uh, input parameters for, say, uh, HTTPS and less for SSH. If I to. In, this, in this case, I have the same amount, but uh, they're different parameters. And then I can do things like composite here, where I want to pass in those or those into there. So let's look at the framework classes that, that I created because I, I, I had done this and like I said, I created a lot of duplicated code. So I wanted to bring this capability that I was using in my design pattern uh, and centralize it. So this item base and item base EDR class, um, it centralizes all the code that really an item does uh, and what an item needs. Um, I don't know. I, I don't really like the name item, but uh, that's what I come up with. So that's what's on the slide right now. Um, but it specifies all the overrides that are required of said items that need to be managed. And the item based EBR is actually used with the manager. The, the other one is more of a composite. It's a very simplistic one. It doesn't have as many BI, so it's meant as light. I would have loved to combine these two, and I hate having these two. But uh, I really, really tried to figure out a way to combine them, but uh, I wasn't able to. But I'll probably continue that because it drives me crazy. Um, so that's uh, one part. And then the other part for the uh, assembler class is the item format uh, base class. And it's the assembler, and it's, it acts like an interface. So it's the you know an abstract class. It doesn't have any code in it. But it does anything. It just defines the load in the same class. And, uh, you can pass this into the uh, the manager, so it's used by the manager in order to, for you to be able to call um, call the load say. And the managing director manages stuff. So um, 
let's actually go into what it specifically does. It manages items, um, and specifically it added, manages any items that are the items that the ER class that inherit from it. Uh, so I'm using a uh, very little table here to do this. This is the design pattern that I really like because it allows me to give names to my objects, object references, uh, and then get them easily. And this works well for like, you have a list box uh, with item names and an ID with it, and you pick it and you say, load into my sub panel this object, pass it to PR, and it says, okay, I'll load it. Uh, so that worked really nice, but uh, so this is how uh, this is how it basically works underneath. And uh, also in this morning's meeting, you don't want to make too much complex code all over the place. This really centralizes the capability instead of spreading it all over my application in slightly different ways. It's still, you know, not as straightforward as having an array of uh, values, but it's. Uh, but it works. So. LUT list under tests? Uh, yeah. Look up table. Look up, okay, yeah. thank you. Sorry. Yeah. At Intel, we make up acronyms. This is what we do. We don't really make chips, we make up acronyms. <laughs> this is why this is the IM. IM up. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and this comes with, uh, the, item, the manager class comes with the multiple uh, methods for actually doing the managing. So that's uh, very simple stuff that I like to lead and get. It's not meant to do things to the object besides rename, and I wasn't able to really get the rename out because because of the implementation with the variant of the table with the ID. It has to kind of know that it happened to the object that you renamed it. So you can't have the object and just rename it out in space. You have to do it through the manager so this. Can you give a couple more examples of what items would be or like under? That's some sort of parent class, like some concrete. Yeah, we'll actually get to that. Okay, perfect. Really soon. And I'll give a demo of that and how that works. Because yeah, I know it's like kind of abstract and just saying item, 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 whatever. Does it say? Um, that's the kind of stuff that I like to do. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. 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 So in here, uh, I have a template as part of this as well, um, and uh, in attempts to eventually make a wizard, which I didn't do. Uh, <laughs> uh, but this template uh, actually inherits uh, from the manager base. It does a few extra things, and plus it wraps all these protected methods in it. Uh, and so when you create these, it does create all these extra methods, which I also don't like, but uh, I do like the way that the DVR acts in the system, so uh, where it, how I can pass it around to different actors and different asynchronous processes and be able to work on the data without having to pass it back asynchronous. So it actually happened to us, we started off without the DVRs and we had this problem of, okay, now you need to say, so you have to tell everybody to send all their change data back to the main thing. It was, it was kind of nice. So this, this makes it a little bit Okay, so here's the actual concrete uh, example of what items would be, what a manager would be, and what the base would be. So here I have a remote config. So this is my uh, SSH piece, uh, or uh, HTTPS uh, class that defines how I'm going to connect to my Git repo. Um, and then I have uh, the actual item class which contains those. So both of those are items, one is just a DR base. Um, and it is of the repo configuration. So why didn't I just choose repo? Uh, it's actually a long story. In, in, the, in the setup that I have, I actually have a repo class uh, and it takes in a repo configuration because I didn't want to have repo that actually does stuff to the repo in my configuration of what I want to do with the repo. So, yeah. um, so I basically pass this one in, and it's a it's a composite, where so it makes up, and it actually defines how it makes the class too. So it says, "I'm oh, a repo of the I'm a get repo." Okay, I, now I'll make an object of get repo. Uh, and then the uh, 
the manager class uh, is one of those. And realistically, I wouldn't do this, uh, and I didn't do this. Uh, I have a bigger, uh, bigger manager class, and uh, actually, no, I think I do have a. I do have a really big manager, but I don't have a really big format class because I, I have a bigger assembler for all my stuff. Uh, so I didn't want to have to assemble all these little time things and have all these format classes uh, together. Because then you eventually have to put it in one document and one piece of data, so it's uh, it, it a bit nice. But for this example, this, that's what that is. The real config format defines uh, how you're going to save and load your, your items. Uh, can I ask, why do you need a specific repo config manager? What does it add that, that the item manager base doesn't doesn't do? Repo config manager. Um, it's it does a few things. So like the init the init method um, of the the class. Um, and we'll actually get into like how it does all this stuff, but the init method is pretty important because it's going to look up the child class, but it needs to know what its type is. Uh -huh. So the template actually defines it, and then when you say that as repo config, it knows like, hey, my it, it's repo, where you yeah. put the specific factory. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so in in this one project that I use it. Uh, in my business layer classes or uh, business logic classes, about 50 out of 136 of these classes uh, were of the inside of the item manager uh, base. Uh, that VI, that load VI, uh, calls the item format, uh, the generic item format base uh, bone method, which is empty, and then that's overridden by the specific type that you want to do, in this case, XML. So, and that actually then creates the repo configs and the repo, uh, repo configs. Okay, so how does it actually load the data items? And here's uh, where the, the, the factory comes in. Um, so the data is loaded, like I said, in the value pairs. Um, and it, it loads it into the class data, and I always have to have a cluster inside of my class data that I want to load. Um, there's usually like other pieces of data that I have, I have in my class, and sometimes it's initialized from that data. Um, so if I want to optimize something, I'll take that data and then optimize it and put it in my class. Uh, but essentially, it's in, into a single cluster that's a lot. Um, which is a little, little bit limited, but uh, it, it works. It worked in all the cases that I've been for. Um, so yeah, so basically it calls um, and it provides this parent target class, which in our case is the repo configuration class, and says, and this is part of the, the template, it says, when you launch and look up my child class, use me as a reference. Um, and I'll get into like how the paths work, but it's pretty simple. Um, and then the data is all loaded by the actual um, item DVR uh, class. So, so that it doesn't have anything to do with the whole class except for some, a few overrides. But uh, So it's loaded into the parent class and into each child class that it has. And uh, I did have to put the actual loading of the data, or right. the, the setting of the data in this top level um, uh, template class here, where you see it passing in, but the other, the child class is being okay, Let me see if I can untangle this. You're creating one object and you're loading the parent's data in that object and the child's data in that object. There's not, you're not talking about two separate objects, are you? <laughs> no, but at this point there is two separate objects. There is an instance one of the, the parent that's of the parent type, uh -huh. and its only purpose yes. is in the template is to get that config data and pass it into the child. Ah, so they can be used as the top, as the yeah. top section. Yeah. When the child. Okay. So uh, I tried to figure out how to fit everything in the bottom one. I really couldn't figure it out, but um, so essentially the bottom class there that is the actual target class that I wanted to make. That's the child class. That's what I'm going to put all the data on and use. The other class is a throwaway that I'm just using to load the data in. Uh, and since I'm already loading it once to figure out which class to load, uh, I'll just pass it up. Um, 
there. So it comes with the template, so it's not too bad. Okay. <clears throat> and in here, you can also add other data types here. So, like here, pass it into remote configs. So, uh, so anything extra, you can pass it. Okay, so now let's go into that BI that is uh, the uh, hybrid-based PDR init method uh, and how it actually loads, loads these. So it's going to uh, first call the uh, set config data on the target parent class to get it into the target parent class so we can look it up. Uh, that's the whole purpose of doing that, and plus it has the data that passes out that we can set at the top level. Um, this is an overwritten method that says, how do I do my class lookup? Which pieces of data from my parent method of my like repo config item, not my repo config underscore git, but repo config, what is the specifier? So in my case, it's repo type, it, git or hg or whatever I'm using. Um, so that specifies that piece of information. Uh, this is kind of a reusable EI that looks up the class based on hierarchy. I'll go on that the next slide. And then I want to set the data of my target child class. So I, I created in my class factory here my uh, my child class, and then I'm going to load the data into that. And then if you remember, top level, I just take the big data out of the parent. So now I have the parent's data and the child's data all in one object. All right, so looking up. Uh, this class, like I said, in, in our case, we're doing repo type. Uh, in the other case, I'm actually taking two pieces of information, repo type, underscore, uh, connection type, and passing that. And that just gets appended onto a path. So I know where my object is, repo config. Uh, I then use that as a base and add on the, add on the suffix. Uh, this one, I think, uh, that I created allows you to do prefixes as well. I don't use the suffix for this because it makes sense. So, and it's easier for me on this. Uh, and then it gets the lab you class I have, and then while I go. Right, so. so setting the uh, class private data, that is done uh, in name value pair, and it's also done by the base class. So I didn't want to duplicate this as well. So what I am doing here is I require you to override these two methods, which are get config data and set config data to be protected so nobody can just set your data. Um, so these allow you to uh, pass out your cluster, and then this reuse API, um, what I'm going to next, that allows you to actually set those values in the cluster and then you and it, it handles as well the, the case where you don't have any data. So just think through it. Um, and those are just clusters uh, with, with flagging. <coughs> so that this reusable BI for setting this, this is made up of open G methods, essentially, uh, that gets some of this data. This isn't the fastest way to load cluster data by far. Uh, <laughs> um, so I would uh, probably not, you know, use this as something that needs to be super performant. Um, in my case, it didn't have to be. It was a, it was a UI. Everything was fast enough. Um, I had another case actually in the database-driven GUI project that I had. I loaded by binary into my objects because it was done at. It was, it was actually used on flyer testing. I didn't want my tests to be hindered by that, so uh, I wouldn't use this at all. Case. There's a lot of data, and this is uh, it's pretty cool, but it's, it's a little small. Uh, but it, it's kind of nice because it does allow you to uh, change your class uh, your class contents pretty uh, pretty nicely. There's not much to do; you just change class contents, and voila, when you save, it's there. And when you load, it's there. If you load something that's missing. Uh, you can catch that, at least this reusable BI does. I don't think I put anything in front of framework because I didn't really care. I just throw a play or something. My object doesn't care about it, so I don't care about it. So you, I think, don't, uh, you don't have any coding here for mutating between versions of, the, of your class? 
Um, is there, or is there a mechanism for inserting that? I don't have that here. It basically says, I don't care. If I didn't find it, I'm not going to load it. I'm going to use the default value, whatever the default value is. And if it um, does find it, but you're not using it, just ignore it? Yeah, just ignore it. It's got a simplistic approach. Okay, so uh, a summary of what we just looked at. So we have our init method here, and pretty much everything is being done by the base class, thankfully. So I had a lot of this all over my project, which was nasty. Um, but, but it's now nicely in this base class here. And some of it's being done uh, in the template, um, but uh, most of it's being done at, at the lower level. So, um, so in the template, you basically get this extra capability of doing the puzzle. All right, so here's, uh, I have some examples on the slide, and then I'll go into the demo. So, uh, here's an example of using this uh, very simple example. Uh, first, we're going to just admit our uh, magic class here. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll pick a format that we want to use, and, and, and we're actually going to uh, define a location. Sometimes this will be a configuration on your system. Um, in my application, though, I also wanted the user to be able to save and load from file or database. So they can load from the database and save it to a file, vice versa. So uh, they can get that flexibility out. Uh, so you can hit, put that into the code, pieces of code in your application that says, okay, generate my, uh, generate my format from here, and then I just pass it into my, the model of my uh, view there, and it'll execute my load method. On my managing class. Um, the next thing is loading. So this is just basically uh, loading based on the format that you just picked. Um, you can save. This allows you to save on the fly and and load on the fly. And it's uh, it is solid compliant in that it, it doesn't expose uh, the actual format to the managing class. It doesn't know about it. It doesn't care. Okay, and then uh, we're actually going to do stuff with our data, right? So in this case, it's very simple. I'm just going to get all of my items. I'm going to get the uh, item IDs out, and then I'm going to print some info that is actually that print function is a uh, it's an item function. So inside of that print function, there's two item calls uh, that prints it out. So it's uh, it's shared, and it's really for debug for me since it's, it's a little bit difficult to get at your data at this point. You just can't put a on the wire. Good if I created a custom code. And here I'm just changing some, uh, renaming some remote configurations here. And then finally I can, again, pick the format that I want to uh, save that. And then closing and destroying. So technically it didn't make, it, it did in the hierarchy chain, the call chain it didn't make it, but it didn't technically make it. But uh, I own, I, I think that I own as the manager class the items in it, so I'm going to show you in this uh, So let's go. similar to what my slides look like, except I now have a little view in here that I can switch to a media file. Um, I'm specifying the database object here, and I'm going to be able to load it, I'm going to do some printing and some renaming, and then I'll be able to pick a lot of output. So here I'm going to say I can do uh, uh, rename original DB, which is in the database, and then uh, rename with mod one. So it says it was renamed, and then I can go to this, 
said that to gain There, and then if I go back to two, so that's essentially how it works. Um, I don't know if you want me to go into any of this code, but we essentially put that on the slide so the side is a load method. Uh, it's just the API that calls this uh, code method, and then inside of that is the regular uh, base class, which calls the format. Can you jump into your save method for a minute? Sure. Um, so I'll say you get the data out of the strings. Yeah. So, I had to set up my XML file nicely. <laughs> That's how I got it. So, here's my XML format. I could probably uh, put some reuse guys around here that I want to be able to show them. Um, yeah, it doesn't just want like OpenG methods under the hood there to get the clusters to uh, strings? Um, yes, exactly. It's a reverse of that other function that I showed. Uh, it's essentially the same OpenG function that I just put together to export that from there. Uh, and the value carriers probably isn't the, the greatest format ever, and that's one of my Things that I'm not looking for is maybe use like a standard like JSON. Is the, is the Git pairs VI generating dispatch so that if you did have a performance thing, you could actually like hand code that in rather than going to the OPG <laughs> reflection? Say that, say that. So you, you said you, you, you call into a method that gets all the pairs out of the cluster. Yes. Um, that uses the OpenG reflection VIs to reflect on the cluster and do all that. Is that dynamic dispatch so that if you had something in a tight loop, you could hand code it in and say, Okay, I'm going to grab this field. And I'm going to just give it this name, so there's no, so it's it can just flow through. I don't actually have that. It's like a reuse VI that I have that I just okay. use. So um, I would have to wrap it in this. I would probably do it in the framework and wrap it. So, okay. But I don't have it. And I really cheated on the database because I got that done this weekend. <laughs> um, but it shows basically how it's. How you do it. So it doesn't work out perfectly with these uh, tables that are kind of crazy. Uh, it worked out really well with that small So in here, I'm actually doing uh, uh, a select. So I'm actually putting uh, some XML inside one of the cells. It wouldn't be great. I shouldn't even show that. <laughs> Anything else on the code that somebody wants to check out before? How many people in here have built something like this for generic serialization and deserialization? Okay. And I know you had a generic serialization. Yeah. I was curious. Does this architecture reflect what you all have built? Is there pieces in here that uh, you see is particularly novel. Um, the, the DVR stands out to me as one that I don't usually see in a, a, an interesting way of handling that. I've never had, I've never had multiple managers in a project. Usually it's a more well, sophisticated instrument pool. So whatever devices can be run on this test system can be plugged in and, and all that. But it's, it's, it, it, it would, it's always been hardware related from my perspective rather than the software aspect of the source code tree. It might have ended up with not too many managers, but I think I had around six. For those of you who've never rolled one of these, is there have you ever found yourselves, you know, looking at something like this? Is there something you've picked up here that's a that's a particular interest? 
I think one thing I found a little bit interesting um, is how he was handling abstracting out like this different save options as classes because that's something I've been considering for one of my reuse libraries um, and I think what one thing I have right now which is probably a cross coupling that at some point should be gotten rid of is as part of like my initialization I say here is the file path that you load or save from and that's in probably the wrong class and if I class that out like he's doing I think that would definitely help solve some of my coupling issues. Yeah, I definitely did it that way uh, with my original project, the uh, database and the GUI project. That one had XML strings going all the way down into small level objects that should have no <laughs> reason to parse XML. So. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of the big mistakes I made initially, so I just passed in the file. The, the configuration file into the object and let the object handle like no no it, it, it didn't worry about parsing data or anything like that it's so someone else did. exactly any other comments questions was there anything in here that you as you were building it felt this ought to be simpler um, something you that you're like I've written this boilerplate far too many times why isn't this just a thing yeah, I mean, I do like the capability to look this stuff up, and I might try using maps. Um, like I said, this isn't needs to be the most before we could, but I did some testing on very little table versus maps. Uh, actually, I did a coding challenge, uh, and I did find out that in some cases, the very little table is still faster than the maps, which is kind of weird to me, but. Uh, it was uh, for very small data types when the data types that you're passing the value. Uh, so, like indexes in an array, um, instead of actually putting the value inside of it, um, that worked out really well. But uh, yeah, so that whole thing is seems like it'd be easier, but maps kind of do it. Just um, I started using the the maps and sets in my first 2019 project make sure you download all patches to 2019 before you start using maps and classes. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, my buddy did that. Uh, I didn't tell him. He was like, uh, yeah, this didn't work, and I crashed. He basically found a four button like, within a week here. Yeah, yeah same. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and we have a uh, fix within two. But a lot of them are already worked around, so it, it was like, don't do this. Or, you know, it's like default data, the weird configuration, like you said. It's all like those weird cases that we do that, come on, man. You think I'm going to think that up and <laughs> test that? Come on. Well, if you had cl if you added classes and then tried to probe, you crashed lab view. Yeah. <laughs> Given who designed the test suite, one of those is really embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So just saying that you have a question about, you know, how you find is it that easier to do to, find, to do this? I think when I try to do those kind of operations, I find I was like having more reflection stuff in that view could be a lot of helpful with a lot of ways where you are very limited. And uh, like, for instance, you know, if you try to do the general optimization in an easy view, you might want to know that this class, before you load it, is of type right. that guy. And right now, this you can cannot do that. So there's a lot of limitation on the reflection side of things that makes creating those to, you know, you have to jump to set or two. So another one that I encountered over that, you know, the run behind the board is great. The thing can be invite, but as soon as you use it, and the thing that you call to inject that, create a reference, you take. As soon as you dial in the VI, the reference is, is going out of the picture. So that cannot create a lot of problems, but difficulties to create with the dependency and the framework. So if, if those stuff were to come into that view sometimes, that would be great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, this is more just a curiosity question. If, if you feel like you've hit a, or if you will, hit a ceiling or something like that to, to uh, the user friendliness of this format, where 
you putting everything into one file, like where I've done this before, and split it into three parts, where it has the SVN updates in one file, does what version of things to load, another one tells you what configuration parameters to load, and, you know, one file can take note through it. In this case, I put everything into one uh, file because so I wanted to track it as one yeah. uh, thing because it was a document per se. So they had uh, like which what the repo configurations were, how they wanted to actually build the project, kind of like a compile project. Uh, and then you know some of this information about the repos. The thing that I did split out, which I kind of combined here just to make it nice to show. Uh, was the authorization part. I actually had that in a separate capability or a separate file because it was a system-based um, authorization. So I had authorization for the SSH, uh, which was like an encrypted uh, certificate or whatever, uh, private key file. Uh, so I would actually unencrypt it on the fly, decrypt it while I was doing it. And the custom one that you know, crazy about like, oh, you need to definitely encrypt this. It's more like, don't let our developers hack into what the, the tool database part of it. Okay. So we'll just look at that. Okay. So uh, why are the manager classes? And um, I even think this myself, uh, why do I need these? But it turns out it does solve uh, one of the problems where you had these multiple asynchronous running uh, uh, modules or actors. So if you have a hierarchy of these, uh, it's really nice. In my case, I have nested subpanels for different editing purposes. Uh, and I want to pass the data specific to that thing. And I don't want to have to pass the whole Lumen reference to the application to it. I just It just needs to know what the repo config is. Uh, so in this case, I can pass that uh, very lightly because it's a DDR. Uh, and then I can modify the data in that, and it gets reflected at the very top level, so I don't have to do this whole, okay, let everybody know I'm gonna save, and now I have to collect data from everybody. Um, that would be ran into when we start just using it. Regular, because I really don't like just jumping to DVRs. Uh, I like to try to use just regular by value, but uh, it's also many really problems. <laughs> Uh, in this case, it, it did work out better than that, so. So, uh, what are the pros of this, uh, when, when I went through this? Uh, one is that it makes loading into the private class data very easy. Like I said, the API is like, they value pairs, but there is a workaround for that. But it's very easy to load it in. Uh, you don't have to write any extra parsing code. Uh, you can add the lead parameters out of your uh, private data and it handles it very nicely. Um, and what I like is that instead of some other methods that uh, you know, I've looked into or seen, um, instead of doing some dynamic stuff like just having the X amount in there or having some kind of a very little table with names and values and stuff, I can actually use my private data in, of my class in my class methods. So I have a cluster that I can unbundle and do stuff with, which is nice. And then I have no format specifiers, uh, parsers, where they don't belong, like by people config, load from X and out, people config, load from B. E. Uh, that's not so good. Um, and it, writes, it, it, it does allow you to simply override uh, uh, to, to do a migration from, say, file to DB base. And then if you want to keep both, Keep both, which is what my goal was and, uh, eventually, was to just keep both. Uh, so it allows it easy just you override one class. And that class is actually a very light class. So that's pretty nice to do. Adding children for the lookup is very easy. If I wanted to add an imperial one, I could just add it. Uh, lots of cons here. So I was supposed to create a wizard and show that one. That would have been really cool. Um, but I didn't. Uh, I, didn't have time. I barely got this done, so. Um, uh, the DVR, I've mentioned this many times, the DVR is nice in a lot of cases, but uh, I look at it and I see all these API methods and it kind of makes me cringe a little bit, but uh, if you look at the whole framework, most of it's protected normal methods uh, in most of the things that you replicate. It's only 
kind of the top level item class that has the DVR, uh, not the children. So if you create a lot of children, you're okay. And then one of the really big thing ones was trying to copy the aggregate classes. That was not very much fun. So if you have managers within managers um, that have then items within them, um, doing a simple copy that you would just do a wire split, that's not not going to happen, and it wasn't very good. So. Um, but I do have a copy object at the top level method for the item base. For the item manager. Um, it is a little bit heavy. Uh, not super heavy, but it's a little bit heavy. Um, and, the, and the nice thing is, though, like again, the item child is the one that you'll be replicating a lot. Uh, item. Uh, you'll do quite a few of those as well, but the, the children are the ones that uh, you need to be making the your actual stuff. So that's actually a lot lighter. But you'll be adding extra methods to those to do stuff with them. So, uh, of course, missing some monitoring debug helpers, except for that print yeah. And then um, it's not as fast as we went into that, like the uh, whole reflection is a little slow, but. Uh, there's other approaches to that, and if you need to do it, you can do it that way. Um, so next steps may be looking to trying to uh, not duplicate the whole non-UDR, DDR items. Um, I did that. I, I used to actually have, for the uh, manager, I had the same thing, and I finally got rid of that, uh, which because that was like four different classes. So um, at least I got rid of that, but not the other. I'll look at that. Maybe use maps. Uh, maybe standardize it in another format instead of name value pairs. It's a little limited when you're looking at like a hierarchy of information. So this is only loading flat data in your cluster. Um, but for me, the hierarchy thing is was actually okay uh, because what I would do is I would just make a composite class with the information that I wanted and then create those and feed them in. So it worked out okay. Um, and for things like arrays, which don't really work that well, with that, I would just do limited strings. And then inside of my initialize method, I would call that. Uh, that overwrite the I that would then initialize the other data in the class so I could use it for important things. So I'll just split it with that <coughs> The other thing that I want to do uh, is to get this in the bit bucket since uh, Intel owns pretty much everything, uh, including the soul. Uh, so I don't have any links for that, but I do have a link for all my memes, and that's you can go to google.com and find all that. <laughs> Very easy. So uh, thank you, and if you have any questions, ask away.